for joining me on the Zeke Sky podcast on this special Ask Me Anything episode. I'm going to do a couple of these. Maybe this will just be a recurring thing. And if I don't get to your question now, I will get to your question in a future episode. A bunch of you submitted questions on social media. And the first one is going to be from Angelo. Angelo told me to, I guess this isn't a question, but talk more about your wrestling journey. I know you still enjoy it from when I saw you at Stray Dogs. Stray Dogs is a club in Trenton, New Jersey for wrestling. I guess this is someone I met. Hi, Angelo. It's nice to uh, see you joining. Um, it's, it's it's a lot to unpack. I'm going to try to keep it short because there is really so much here. But basically the thing that always drove me towards wrestling in the beginning was just responding to bullying. I really wanted a way of um, defending myself. I was bullied a lot when I was younger and learning some type of self-defense was kind of necessary, but also there was a certain point where, you know, a math teacher, someone whoever was coaching the middle school team when I was in eighth grade, when I started, sort of took me over to this room and I just saw what seemed to me to be just absolute pandemonium. I was like, how could they let this go on in school? And then as the years went by, I started really, really just being completely sucked in and I couldn't, it was, you know, all that I ever thought about And in my journey, um, I was able to accomplish quite a bit in high school and won like 115 matches and I won the section tournament and I got to the state tournament where I took fourth. Ultimately for me, pursuing my music career was something that felt like it was a hard decision. It was extremely hard and to to choose to stop wrestling basically is what I did at a certain point because, um, At a certain point, my heart was more in music, but wrestling is a sport that will have my heart for forever and is a sport that I am very involved with now and hoping to become increasingly more involved with as the years go by. All right, next we have Kane. Kane asked two questions. He's getting greedy. Kane says, what were the songs or exercises that gave you the biggest breakthroughs in your playing and technique? And can you show any examples of how your songwriting has evolved from the beginning until now? And what influenced your style of songwriting? The songs or exercise, the biggest breakthroughs, I mean, a lot of things come to mind. I think the earliest thing that I really remember just kind of pounding to the wall was Paul Gilbert's picking just madness. I mean, not even madness. There's there's a lot of order to a lot of Paul Gilbert's um, picking technique where there's this very finely described method of doing the most economical picking you possibly can and tilting the pick in a sort of way with your thumb, which was actually, it was interesting. When I when I first saw Paul Gilbert's Picking Mechanics video, he talks about how for the first 10 years of playing, he held the pick on the flat part of his, uh, or, you know, on the tip of his first finger and the tip of his thumb, and then he switched it around to this angle. I actually always held it naturally at that angle. I didn't do it to pick efficiently. I just did it because I think it helped me with dynamic control on guitar. So the alternate picking stuff was a huge deal to me. Then at a certain point, I think, you know, after maybe a long time of getting through a lot of alternate picking stuff, there was a moment where I realized that to play things as efficiently as possible, you wanted to be able to play full legato. You wanted to be able to play any idea you possibly could with picking, with just hammer-ons and pull-offs, even if that meant hammering on from nowhere. And this is right around the time I started discovering guys like Guthrie Govan, who really were able to unlock more of the dynamics of the guitar through being able to start phrases with just the left hand and kind of add to them with the right hand. ...of how your songwriting has evolved from the beginning until now, and what influenced your style of songwriting? That's a complicated and loaded question. I think that the things that we experience personally color songwriting... I don't think songwriting has so much to do with guitar technique. I try to divorce it from guitar technique. My idea on guitar or any instrument is to have as much raw mastery as I can so that I can bring it as effectively to songwriting as possible. I think the best thing that you can do for songwriting is to experience the extremes of human emotions. You know, go out and get your heart broken. Go out and be broke and have dreams and all of these things. They all fuel the songwriting. But then also there is a side to me that is very engaged with philosophy and literature and history and military history and all of this, all of this. And it always just, what happens is it just started splitting into the way you write. You can't avoid it at a certain point. When you start communicating and thinking through things in a certain way, it emerges 
in how you write a sentence, it emerges in how you write a phrase, any of these things. So I would suggest if you're trying to increase your songwriting capacity, to increase your breadth of experience and the dynamics of those experiences. CA asks, are you happy with the way things are going? You never smile. You know, I'm just, I don't try to be so expressive with my emotions these days. I used to be the type of person who really wore my emotions on my sleeve. And now I'm the type of person who is very cognizant of the up and downs that happen. And not that putting out happiness is the wrong thing. I don't want to say that. But that constantly forcing yourself into a position where you look a certain way for the camera is just not what I'm about. There are definitely days where I'm having a hard time. I like I have a lot of hard days. We all have a lot of hard days. So deciding whether or not I am happy is a very complicated and loaded question. I will say that as I climb further towards my goals, the peaks seem to become higher. It's almost like a mirage. If you know the myth of Sisyphus, that is frequently what I feel like. But um, it's a process every day, man. It's a, a question of taking care of my mental health, trying to find the things in life that guide me in greater symmetry with nature and with my body. I would say, on the whole, I'm approaching more happiness, but I would also say that happiness is not my goal. Jeff asks, what hair products do you use? None. I don't use any hair products. Maybe some shampoo or conditioner. But my hair is a mess, actually. I know you see pictures of it, but just ask my friends uh, how the hair actually is in person. It's very difficult to manage, man. It's very, very difficult to manage. I only recommend it if you have, like, a large degree of patience for it. It is difficult. That's why I started sh shaving off the sides, just completely, you know, conspicuously trying to rid myself of a solid 75% of it. it. That's been helpful, I guess. Samantha asks, what would you change in your life if you could change one thing? This is a pretty difficult question. I'm inclined to say nothing. I'm inclined to say that everything that you think you would want to change is a grass is greener kind of thing. There are moments where I feel like something is missing or that I feel like, you know, there are things that are out of my reach. But to say that there is one thing that I would change that I would absolutely change is just a complicated, maybe not the most altogether useful form of my energy. I guess if there, if I had to really point at one thing, though, it would be to have more time, to just have more time in a day or more time in a year, more time over a decade. Somehow the time tax is really bad. It really limits what you can focus on. You only have so many days on this earth. So you have to be really useful with time. William asks, do you have any plans to play the Pacific Northwest or the Seattle area? Yeah, I, I think we have hopefully plans to play everywhere. COVID really, so just for some perspective for people who are tuning into the podcast or just know my music from recently, this is my first album to come out. And it was a massive exertion on me in basically every single way. And the band basically, or, you know, the music all came together during the course of COVID. So this is a very new thing. I am very, very much wanting to play now that a bassist has come into the fold and some East Coast shows are about to be announced very soon. We've got, we've got Tim asking who my favorite piano composer is. And, you know, for so many years, this, this is a question that would have elicited my frowning for not being able to choose one. But I'm going to go ahead and have to say that at this point, Keith Emerson is my favorite piano player, period. And it might not even be all that close. Um, th there, there's other people I love. I love Mozart. I, I love so many composers. But there's something about a lot of the organ solos and a lot of like the fusing of Baroque and Romantic and Impressionist piano within Emerson, Lake and Palmer that really just strikes me as totally genius. I love Mozart. I love the Mozart stuff. A lot of the Mozart stuff I've just pushed myself on and I love. But um, Keith Emerson is the guy that I'm constantly putting on in my car. All right. And the final question here, it's a doozy. Wow. Sam writes, 
who is the greatest commander? Who is the greatest commander? So I don't even think I'm really qualified to have a favorite opinion here. I shall preface with that. That being said, I have a couple of criteria by which I judge the people we know best, especially in the ancient world. And I'm going to go ahead and guess you're asking about those people because that's uh, what I write about and talk about in the podcast. And of all of them, you know, of the Julius Caesars and Alexander the Greats and Pyrrhus of Epirus and Hannibal and, the, you know, there's other guys. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of guys. You know, there's only one who really didn't start with anything, right? So Hannibal Barca had his dad who was a great military commander, and Alexander the Great inherits the greatest army the world had ever seen, and so many people inherited stuff. Caesar didn't. He kind of grew up in the seedy area of town near the strip clubs and not so much money. He came from a fa famous family, but they lost all of it, and he had to work back all that ground himself. There's a story of Julius Caesar actually crying at a statue of Alexander the Great, because Caesar was about a decade older than Alexander the Great was in this statue. You know, Alexander was 33 years old, and he had taken his nasty army across from Greece into Persia and into India and all these crazy places and basically conquered the world. And Julius Caesar is crying next to this thing, apparently. Maybe this is hyperbole, but I could see it being true based on other things I know about Julius Caesar. And the funny thing is, if I had been there to console Julius Caesar, I would remind him that he started out really with uh, none of the Nepo baby wonders that Alexander the Great started out with. And by the time he's in his 50s, his accomplishments are pretty much equally impressive. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the Ask Me Anything version of the Zeke Sky Pat podcast. I will be joining you guys with another awesome podcast that I've put together on Alexander the Great that is coming very soon. And I hope we we'll see you guys soon.